What's going on, everybody? It's that time again, the All Sooners Podcast, episode 132 on this wonderful Wednesday, July 20th, 2022. Back with you. We had a week away from the show, not from work. Definitely not from work. We were busy in Big Swim Media Days in Arlington. Took a week off from the pod, but we're back. We have a lot to get to. Guys, how are we doing? Josh Calvin, Oklahoma City, Ryan Chapman, and more. John Hoover in Tulsa. How are we doing, fellas? I never thought I'd say we're too busy to podcast, but last week we were literally too busy to podcast. Just never fit. Yeah, it just never happened. Nope, just couldn't fit it in Wednesday, Thursday. Uh, so apologies for that. Uh, we will uh, we will hit the double pod once. What was that? What would that be next month in a couple of weeks when training camp starts? Maybe. Up. So yeah, uh, yeah we'll up. have some special double podcast coming up. Yeah, for sure. And uh, I just remember last year. Uh, us sitting down and having to podcast as they're literally breaking down all of the tables and everything, trying to change that bad boy <laughs> over to a concert. Uh, I didn't think we were going to test our luck again. They brought some bigger uh, equipment crew this time that were much more threatening. <laughs> they were, weren't they? Yeah, it was shutting down quick. Um, it was like half the tables already gone. Like it was literally the breakouts were ending and they was already being packed up. They were ready to get the heck out of there, which yeah. I don't blame anybody. It's a Probably long time. but like, some supervisor got in, almost got in a fight with one of his coworkers about you're not doing anything. Get over here and help us. I'm doing all this. <laughs> they started yelling at each other right, like right next to us. I was like, "Can you guys go away?" So I can of uh, of Ryan with the uh, the basketball, uh, yes. you know, people cleaning the arena. That's you right. Yeah. Go back to that throwback. Yeah. You never know what you're going to get at a post press <laughs> event, no. man. No, no, absolutely not. I, I got locked in the stadium at the spring game. We're, if you're there long enough, <laughs> goofy things will happen. So that that's the lesson learned. We sit here today, gentlemen, 45 days. That's it, 45 days until Oklahoma plays UTEP on September 3rd. I still am just terrified of the weather because it's been over 100 every day for like three weeks now, seemingly. Sweat dripping, so that game's going to be – if, if this last month has been any indication, that game is going to be quite toasty, but it's coming up really, really quickly, just a little over six weeks until the game, until Oklahoma plays an actual football game, which is amazing because it feels like we've been waiting forever. This has been the longest offseason ever. Um, I would disagree. It's been the shortest offseason ever because of uh, World Series. Y- yes, that yeah, the summer is the shortest ever, but the wait, it just feels like to me that Lincoln left and Venables was hired like, five years ago yeah like, let's get some games and we're We've finally like getting somewhere thousand stories written about lincoln and brent venables and yeah some games played so you're right about that yes and two, the, weeks from, two weeks from today is my guess we haven't been officially announced but i think it's two weeks from today wednesday august 3rd is my guest don't hold me to this but i think that's uh gonna be ou media day and then on the fourth they start practice so yeah. two weeks from tomorrow they start practice it's about time. It's about time. We we need to get there. The you know the USC and Caleb Williams saga that just it won't die. There's a new story like every week. It's like let's just play some games, please God. So we're finally getting somewhere. We will start with Big Twelve Media Days um, last week in Arlington. The three of us were there, obviously with intern Ross Ross Loveless, who was a, a big help. We pumped out so much uh, from the two days there in Arlington. So it's also there, obviously not going anywhere. If you're watching, you want to catch back up on anything these guys wrote or any of the breakout sessions with the players or Brent Venable's press conference. They're all there. They're all on Who's YouTube page, John Hoover Media. Apologies again. You can't hear the questions. That makes people go crazy. It was the same last year as this year. It's not our fault. I promise. There's just simply no way because the the way the Big 12 has it set up, the, the, the media is not mic'd. So the only way around it would be if we literally had every single media member hold a mic for us. I'm thinking they don't want to do that, probably. Um, so, and also, it's a breakout session. It's not like a normal press conference where it's like one at a time. It's very, it's not very organized in that regard. So there's just no way around it. It's just kind of the way it, the way it is, unfortunately. I've um, decided next year I'm going to bring a bullhorn with a little speaker good. on the side, the electric kind with the cord, you know, the little coiled cord, and I'm going to shout to the players and the coaches my questions <laughs> so people will stop yelling at me on YouTube and in the comment section about, why are you guys not smart enough to figure out to bring a mic? I'm supposed to bring my own mic now? Come on, people. Well, again, we, we are in a Jerry world, which is a cavern, an absolute cavernous yeah. facility that you there's so much air, you can hear the air conditioning and nothing else. I was sitting right in right behind Eric Bailey. I couldn't hear the questions at all. Yeah. Right behind him. And he was talking to the person in front of the 
you know, whoever it was, the Marvin Mims or whatever, I couldn't hear a word coming out of his mouth. It's such dead air in there. So yeah, I mean, we're trying our best. We're trying to bring you the answers, not necessarily the questions. Yeah, well, you can't hear anything in there. And again, even if we did bring a mic, that would require each media person to basically help us out and say their question to a mic. And they're not going to do that. Well, th- this is why every other major organized press conference set up, like the NCAA, this is why the Big 12 at the podium, SEC. The, at the podium, the SEC, you know what they do? They already have a mic set up and it's a, hey, everyone raise your hand. You have to toss it over, all that stuff. Right. You guys got very familiar with that. That's that process for the Women's College World Series, the Men's College World Series. That's why all that audio is crystal clear because that's on the setup. So Big 12, even, figure it out. Not yeah, hard. Even, you know, the week the press conference is with Brent at the stadium, they're not, the, the, the media is not mic for those either, but it's a very quiet room. It's a much smaller room, and you can just hear the questions through Brent's mic. Well, like who was saying, at t Stadium, it's a big, just giant space. You can't, you can't hear anything. So that's just, just kind of the way it is. Yeah, it's just yeah. dead. Now, OU does mic up the crowd for the, for the weekly press conferences. They have those uh, – stick mics that point out into the, into the crowd. Right. So, so right. we're mic'd up for those, but what has to happen there is the engineer has to flip the mic on for the question and then flip the mic off. That's why you hear like joining in the middle of a question, or sometimes it's cut off earlier. If there's a back and forth, it, it's a little awkward, but yeah, we're, we're all figuring out the sound thing, you know, hang know with us. Thinks. We'll do our best. Yeah. I, I know it thinks it thinks for us too. Cause we go back and try and find something and it's, right. it's impossible. Yeah. Nothing we can do. Hey, just look at it this way. A couple of years, won't have to deal with that anymore. The three of us will be on the floor of the College Football Hall of Fame. Absolutely. Getting out to uh, Hotland or Nashville. Know. I think it might be moving to Nashville at some point. So uh, we'll, we'll see. It's a moving target, SEC Media Days. We'll get there at some point. We're going to talk some SEC Media Days in just a minute because OU and Texas have been a hot topic uh, out there in Atlanta. But we'll start, like I said, with Big 12 Media Days. It's all there for you, like I said. If you want to catch up, you missed anything, Tons of content on allsooners.com and on John Hoover Media from Media Days. But to kind of put a bow on it, because we didn't do a show last week, just some general things that stuck out from Brent, from the OU players. Um, I certainly have things that stuck out to me, but I'll, I'll open up to you guys first. Just main biggest takeaways, I guess. That's kind of broad, but biggest takeaways from uh, from the week in Arlington. Yeah. Uh, I'll start with the one that I wrote about this morning, which was the Dime Time Retreat, the Dylan Gabriel takes his uh, offensive uh, skill position players to Lawton for a getaway, for a, kind of a uh, just a retreat. A couple of people have written about it, fun stuff. We got a story posted this morning about it. Different angle, completely different angle, because there's been, guess what, another retreat since that one. Uh, back in June, right. this one uh, the in July was about the offensive lineman. They, he took the old lineman out to Lake Thunderbird. So uh, he takes defensive guys out to dinner just kind of hand picks them says, would you like to come to dinner with me? What's cool about this is I'm presuming that all these uh, reservations and everything were paid for by Dylan. He's the one making the reservation. He's the one putting the down payment or be Airbnb, whatever. Sure. We we've got, I'm got, I'm just going to guess. I don't know that their family is independently wealthy. I don't know if he has like a second job off campus, you know, working the books for, for some local accounting firm. I don't know. I don't think so. I think this is an NIL production. This is a byproduct of his NIL opportunities and resources. He's taken that and putting it to good use for uh, team building, team building opportunities. It's it's a great use of NIL. Um, well, so a lot of players talked about Dylan. All Sooners is where you can find that story. Uh, boy, Brent Venables talked about him too, had a lot to say about him, including he's a galvanizer of people. I've never heard those words before, but cool stuff from all those guys on just kind of the, the, the newness and the maybe the need for Dylan Gabriel to build a, an immediate, and we talked about this in the spring, build that immediate leadership foundation, and guys are following him now. It is it has been impressive to watch. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't. We haven't seen leadership like this at Oklahoma, and I don't. It's going to just come off as me just dumping on the other quarterbacks. But we haven't seen leadership like this from the quarterback spot probably since Baker. Uh, this is. He's really blown me away big time yeah. with uh, how how much he stepped right in and just become immediately face the program type of guy as the as the new I mean the new guy transfer quarterback pretty impressive. Jalen Hurts would fit in that a little bit, but he led with a different style. You're right. Sure, sure. Well, and, and just Dylan Gabriel's the first quarterback we've gotten at Big Twelve Media Day from Oklahoma since Baker <laughs> Mayfield. Yeah, so true. it's I 
you've had different styles of leadership from Baker to Kyler to Jalen, then obviously Rattler and Williams. But you also had Kyler Murray was a guy who was a transfer. He had been an, on OU's campus for a little bit, though, obviously due to the hijinks of how Lincoln Riley handles his quarterback battles. Um, Kyler wasn't named the starter, so he didn't come. Jalen wasn't named the starter, so he didn't come. Dylan Gabriel comes in and is a guy that had as much time on campus as Jalen Hurts and is already being rolled out as the face of the program. It's just a different look from anything that I've had since I've started covering this team, um, which isn't that long. The other thing, too, was um, from Venables on down to Gabriel Mims, Woody, Ethan Downs, just an understated almost showing from Oklahoma. They were comfortable in the spotlight, cool, calm, and collected, but it was very much a, hey, preseason stuff. You feel slighted? Eh, we'll find it on the field. Like, all, all that stuff, yeah. which is uh, – they were so unbothered and so just focused on themselves. Um, I, again, don't know what that will mean for wins and losses, but you can tell we've talked so much about the culture, culture, culture. That's what Brett Venables hammers all the time. A very different approach of just we've got to focus on us and do the little things to make us better and all that other stuff will come. I think that they're on the right track early on, haven't had been tested by games, all that stuff, all those caveats. But as far as like where you can be mentally getting this culture change gone, uh, looks like they're ready to rock and roll. Also, uh, except for the one, what you're saying is right, except for the one moment when Marvin Mim said we run the conference. <laughs> yeah. Marvin Mims like has an the, edge. The one sound bite that we had that was, ooh, did you hear that? No, ooh, nothing ooh. else happened over the course of two hours of players and, and an hour and, what, 30, 40, 15 minutes of, of coaches. Nothing else was said that was inflammatory, except maybe the Bedlam thing, where Brent yeah. Venable said, in response to Mike Gundy the day before, saying Bedlam is dead, Bedlam is history, uh, Bedlam has one or two games left. Uh, Mike Gundy said that supporting his president and his athletic director. Brent Venables came out the next day, guys, and said, this is a hugely important game to everybody in this state. Some days, it, sometimes it breaks your heart. Sometimes it lifts you up. But everybody gets to experience it. Everybody gets to enjoy it. It's it's significant to everyone. Uh, he said, we want to win this state. Brent Venables said, we want to win this state. You know, yeah, win a national championship, win a Big 12 championship, whatever. Win all your games. But he's expressly said, we want to win this state. That's in direct response to Oklahoma State people saying, eh, Bedlam, whatever you're going to do. I think it was Spencer Sanders said, if you're going to go to the SEC, then go to the SEC, whatever. It's like, uh, yeah. okay, that this is fun. Yeah, you guys that, need to get together more often. Yeah, that uh, that was going to be my biggest takeaway. I'm, I'm a sucker for the Bedlam drama. <laughs> I, it's it's extremely entertaining. Um, I We've talked about this before. Hoove and I are a little more partial to the Bedlam game continuing than Ryan is. We, I don't know. I, I'd like to see it continue. I don't think it's going to. I think there's just too many sour grapes there, especially obviously on Oklahoma State's end of it. But boy, it was a lot of fun just hearing Mike Gunny talk about it. And yeah, especially who, like you said, Spencer Sanders, he was, he was especially boisterous about it. And he is very willing. Um, we heard it last in the lead up to Bedlam. And he talked about it in media days. He was feeling good. The fact that they won Bedlam last year. I think he said something like, they talked a lot of crap last year, so it felt good to win that game. But it was like, man, he'll just he'll just say stuff, which is uh, fun for that kind of a setting, of course. And it's just it's fascinating to see where this where this goes. And if this year is the last Bedlam game, which it could be, I mean, buckle up. It's going to be fireworks again, I'm sure. And Spencer Sanders' last go at it and all that stuff. And after last year's game, the way that went, it's fun. I, the, the Bedlam storyline, it just keeps on going, but I, I love it. It's 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 a lot of fun. Funny how win one game and all of a sudden uh, it becomes a uh, a big to do again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, that's the nature of a one sided rivalry, I guess. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And to backtrack real quick too, to something Ryan said, I wanted to touch on real fast about the fact that to Dylan Gabriel's the fact that he's already the quarterback. That that is part of it, I think. I think that's a good point. And as far as we don't have the shenanigans of. Who's quarterback? Who's it going to be? They they brought him in. Jeff Levy said in January, this is our guy. He's coming in to be the guy. And I think that has helped Dylan Gabriel. Matt. I mean, if if this was if all things were the same, but it was an open competition and Gabriel was battling with Ralph Rucker or whoever for the starting job, 
maybe this all doesn't work the same. Maybe the dime turn retreat and all that stuff doesn't happen. Maybe Gabriel's personality, it would just happen anyway. But who knows? I think the fact that he was able to be brought in and told is your team. I think that definitely has helped. So that was a good point that I thought uh, we're touching on. It's going to be fun to see this team. And yeah, the, the mentality and kind of the overall, everybody loves everybody, everybody loves the culture. What about Marvin Mims, especially? You brought up who, how he said we run the conference, how he talked about how much better the culture is, how much more unified the team is. I mean, not yeah. shots at Lincoln Riley and, and the team before, but basically, you know, at the same time, it's, it's that stuff is very interesting to me. He told 24-7 he would have transferred if Lincoln Riley comes back. Great point, yeah. This is a guy who set every product productivity record there is in the state of Texas. Single season, career, catches, touchdowns, yards. He was incredibly productive. And then they get him at Oklahoma and he catches 37 passes his freshman year. And you're like, okay, that's pretty good for a freshman. What does he do? What was it, 35? His uh, sophomore year, and you're like, wait a minute! I thought this guy was a hundred catch kind of kind of guy. He is a hundred catch kind of guy if you throw him the football. Uh, Lincoln Riley didn't throw him the football. He said he was leaving. He was out if Lincoln Riley came back, and he had already made up his mind. We're talking last November. He had already made up his mind. Yeah. So um, yeah, I mean, Lincoln Riley leaves, and Marvin Mims comes back. Um, I I predict a big year. Uh, those guys have talked, and they talked a lot at Big Twelve Media Day. Uh, Marvin and Dylan talked about their rapport, their chemistry, working together, best friends, all this kind of stuff. Um, you know, but if they both stay healthy, could we see Marvin Mims turn in 80, 90 catches this year? Well, and Marvin Mims pointed out, too, that it's his third quarterback in three years, right? So he's he, not right. only do you have a different OC, but you have that different chemistry. It's just so different. Both of those guys initially coming in, Rattler, redshirt freshman, where the show is very much about him. Caleb Williams comes in, takes over midway through the year. It's a Caleb Williams-centric thing. Dylan Gabriel is very much a, at least outwardly, whatever the team wants, that's what we're good for. Um, he, he used that like copied and paste response two or three times to answer a few different questions when it came to being at Big 12 Media Day. So when you got those two guys already on the same page and just that kind of demeanor from Gabriel of, hey, if Marvin Mims is our playmaker, what's good for the team is for me to get the ball into his hands. should be a different approach just from quarterback looking to find him. And that's what you get when you have an experienced guy versus Spencer Rattler, who was digesting college football for the first time. Caleb Williams is in the same boat. Absolutely. And it's fascinating, you know, Marvin to be that open about, you know, I, I probably was going to leave if uh, if things had stayed the same. It was status quo. And it goes back to the conversation that we had back whenever, you know, after the season ended where, when Hazelwood left and Stogner, a lot of those guys are probably going to leave anyway, even if Lincoln was still here. It was, it felt like an exodus was coming. Yep. Now, again, the way that that season ended was probably a large product of the fact that Lincoln was, you know, had a foot out the door, was planning to leave. But it felt like the way when the, the home of that season, it felt like, some of these guys are going to leave. Um, they're just not being used the way that they feel like they probably should be being used. And Marvin Mims was right in that category. So that that's certainly a big win that OU got from Lincoln leaving was uh, keeping Marvin Mims, who's the best receiver on this team, um, pretty clearly. So big, so big win there. I have a question. If if they go down to Waco and win that game, it was a close game. If they, if they win that game, what was it, 27-13, I think 27-14, something like that. If they're able to win that game at the end and they go into that last game, that Bedlam game, uh, again, that was a close game. They, the OSU needed a fourth quarter comeback to, to win it. Um, if they win those two games, what are we talking about today? Are we still, is Lincoln gone? It's a fascinating. You know, they play in the Big 12 championship game. Let's just presume at that point they're going to beat Baylor again in the Big 12 title game. 13 and 0, and you're in the playoff. Uh, and, you know, maybe you've got a shot at a national title. Probably not, not in last with the way last year shaped up. But let's just say you, you win your first game in the playoff and get to the national title game, lose to Georgia. Are we talking about this right now? What would have happened? What would Oklahoma fans be, be thinking right now about uh, Lincoln Riley as opposed to what they're currently thinking? It's, it's fascinating, wild kind of a Twilight Zone episode kind of feel to it. It is. Boy, it's just crazy to think about because they're that close. I mean, they went ten and two last year. They're that close to being twelve and zero. Well, I I think the the more interesting scenario is, you, yes, the scoreboard in Waco was close, but that game was not close. Oh, he was no, getting their head beat in along agreed. the line of scrimmage. Um, the second half, especially. Yeah, if Caleb Williams just takes houses that ball that who you and I like stopped writing for a minute and almost started <laughs> deleting in the uh, 
Uh, we almost trashed a couple of really good stories. It in, was in silent. The, it was yeah, silent in, in Boone Pickens for about three seconds. When Caleb broke that for a minute, everybody was like, oh, yeah, everybody. It, it, like if he houses that, OU's rolling back to Arlington with the it's the same old thing you saw against Texas with Kyler, right? OU going to the Big 12 championship game. If you beat Baylor, then you go to the committee and say we have one loss. We avenged that loss. Right. With all the hijinks and stuff that happened on championship Saturday. OU's in the college football playoff again, most likely. If you find a way to regroup and win that Baylor game. Now, do you do that with a coach that's actively sabotaging? Maybe, potentially, allegedly, uh, going to the Big 12 championship week. There are so many things that I've just been thinking like yeah. Caleb Williams just could have hurled out of one tackle. What world are we living in? You and this that's is, the thing. Yeah. You, you say actively sabotaging. He, We get the feeling he was. We don't know for sure. We get the feeling he was. Not like yeah. he was planning ahead to leave is what, sure. what I, is the way I call it. What but I was going to say. If yeah. he was going into the playoff last year, you wouldn't actively sabotage a playoff team. You would try your butt off to win the game and win a national championship, and then you got a decision to make. You, USC sitting over there waiting on you at $10 million a year, but you just want to – or at least competed for a national title at Oklahoma. What are you going to do? Why are we wasting time talking about Lincoln Riley? Everybody wants to hear about Brent Venables, but still, it, fascinating. Yeah. Like I said, it's like an episode of The Twilight Zone. No, for sure. And that, that is where the conspiracy is that, you know, that not that he threw games, not that he intentionally losing, but that he was – under preparing because if we win these games, it, it's going to put me in a pickle big time. And he probably leaves anyway. Brian Kelly did it. You know, he yeah. left Notre Dame when they were still on the bubble to make the playoff. Yep. Um, so he probably, you know, it just probably delays it, but it's, an, it's a fascinating uh, turnaround. So Marvin Mims though, that, that was a very little interesting peek at the curtain. That's how that we got a, got on that tangent of uh, Marvin Mims. He probably would have left if, um, yeah. if thanks Marvin change. Appreciate you. Appreciate you for that little piece of that little nugget there from Mr. Mims. All right, let's shift over to SEC media days, which are this week going on currently in Atlanta. OU and Texas have been um, part of the conversation, as you might guess, uh, because the SEC move, which was announced one year ago tomorrow, <laughs> uh, believe it or not, it's already been a full calendar year uh, of of this being our reality. It still doesn't feel real that OU and Texas are going to go play in the SEC. We're a year later. First time getting to hear from Sankey really talk about it. These coaches get asked about it. What are some thoughts from what we've seen so far? And again, SC Media is still in progress, but we've gotten to hear from Sankey, some coaches. Uh, Lane Kiffin has some interesting comments. Mike Leach has some interesting comments. Some thoughts from uh, from afar out there in Atlanta yeah. on, uh, on what so, the SC seems to think of these additions. You guys remember, and I'm sure our readers will and listeners will as well, uh, Hoover, why are you why are you in Broken Arrow? You're supposed to be in Atlanta. I am supposed to be in Atlanta. Had a little change of plans. I, I instead of covering it uh, in Atlanta, things change, things happen. Uh, <laughs> I'm covering it here in Tulsa. So uh, we have stories on the website about the angles that everybody's taking about Oklahoma and Texas joining the SEC. First one off the docket was Lane Kiffin saying it's a different, you know, uh, USC going to the uh, Big Ten. Not really much of a step up. But uh, yeah, when you're in the SEC, it's a different animal. It's a whole other animal is the way he phrased it. And then you got Mike Leach yesterday coming out and saying, yeah, no, it's uh, it's going to be a, a significant change for those guys coming into the SEC. So um, Greg Sankey really didn't have too much to say about it, other than I thought it was interesting. He said that uh, Oklahoma and Texas presidents and athletic directors have been in on the meetings, the planning meetings, the Zooms, the get-togethers, not not media days, obviously, and uh, not the the upcoming meetings, but um, just in terms of, okay, here's how we, here's what we discuss, here's how we lay things out, here's how our meetings are structured, here's the questions we ask, uh, here are the topics that are important to us here in the SEC. Sure, you guys can come on down and, and attend these meetings, kind of like members of the uh, the the new Big 12 attended spring business meetings in uh, in June. Uh, yeah. in Arlington, you know, they've been invited. Joe Stiglione and Chris Del Conte and those guys have been invited to a lot of the big, the SEC meetings. So I, I find that interesting as well, that the SEC is not afraid of um, future members coming and, you know, stealing their ideas. Like Mike Gundy said, why are we, why are they, why are they here? Why are they at our meetings? They shouldn't be at our meetings. They're joining the SEC. Mike Gundy sounded a little paranoid on that. Well, I, I think it was interesting too, how, uh, 
Sankey didn't say much, but he did say kind of just chuckled at the Big Ten. Like, you thought going out and adding USC and UCLA was anything? You see what we did last summer with this Oklahoma and Texas duo night and day better than that. But I also thought it was interesting that basically Joe Kuzikli was forced into making a statement by comments made last week. Brett Yormark, the new Big 12 commissioner, he said it at the podium during the press conference that was broadcast. But again, I was standing there for his little breakout session and he was asked about Oklahoma and Texas and, and what's the timeline on that. And he maintained the, the Big 12 is open for business, right? If we can find a win-win, obviously his number one priority is to better the Big 12. But he's like, we're willing to at least talk about it. Whereas Bob Bowlesby, who comes from a very different background, does the, you know, makes the lawyers happy of the they're here till 2025. It's the same rhetoric you see from Oklahoma and Texas publicly, all that stuff. Sankey was more of that, of just like that's between them. But it forced Oklahoma and Texas to come together and be like, hey, we're still here till 2025, by the way. I know everyone everyone's talking about it in the background, but this is still our plan. Sankey did also specifically say that there's a plan to ramp up OU and Texas from active listening almost in these meetings to active participants yeah. in the 2024 year, kind of moving into 2025. So thought that was interesting that that seems to be the most telling stuff. Pete Thamel on college football final. So when you look at the contracts based off who holds everything, if OU and Texas are to leave early, the most likely scenario is they just leave one year early. So I know that 2023 was the thing thrown around. That's how we have reporting yeah. on, $80 million is the number for OU and Texas to, to be playing the SEC next year. It just really sounds like the, the way that everything's coasting along. 2025 may be a real possibility, maybe 2024, but seems like we've we've pushed this back a little bit. One more trip to Stillwater and Manhattan and and all those fun spots that we is, love so much. Is Hoove coming to Manhattan or is he just saying, no, That's I'm it. doing that one from home. You guys can deal with the hill. You got to get milk. <laughs> no nope. strawberry milk. Ooh, that's that's a tough one. Either fall down on the hill or get some strawberry milk. Which one would I rather do? <laughs> well, you can do both. Uh, it's just a matter of which which do you want to avoid. Are you willing to sacrifice the milk to avoid a fall? That's the really the question. Um, do I get naked in Bill Snyder Family Stadium parking <laughs> lot again? <laughs> Have to, as per tradition. Bring an extra pair of pants. I Why was hoping. I was hoping there was a there was some kind of uh, camera, some kind of surveillance <laughs> camera. Where the like guys were talking about saying, "Why is this Good guy man. taking his pants off at <laughs> whatever it was midnight in our parking lot?" Get an email from K State reps. You're banned. From <laughs> us anymore. Well, just at Johnny Hoover, at Josh M. Cowley, at Raiders Ryan on Twitter. Let us know the first SEC stadium that Hoover's going to moon uh, in, in our comments. Yeah. The first SEC stadium. Place your bets. Place your bets now. It's got to be Arkansas. It's got to be Arkansas, doesn't it? I mean, that's normal in Arkansas. Little Rock or Fayetteville? Fayetteville. Fayetteville. <laughs> Northwest Arkansas, the hills. Naked men walking through the parking lot after a football game. Part Normal. of the culture. I, yeah, had, I had figured Normal. Stark Vegas would be up there. <laughs> just the Grove. Just, just going <laughs> to enjoy the Grove. <laughs> That was honestly, you know, my main one of my main things from from these last few days of SEC Media Days is just I can't wait to be in that conference because it's just so many personalities, Lane and Leach and all these guys. They all have the same galaxy brain take of the SEC schedule is harder. It's like, oh, didn't know that. Oh, you yeah. text probably you just you just blew Josie and, and Del Connie's minds with that that the SEC schedule is harder. Uh, I'm sure they never even thought about that. Did you guys uh, see the question? Like to uh, Lane Kiffin about there's two strong, colorful, forceful personalities in the state of Mississippi with you and Deion Sanders. He stopped the questioner and said, you forgot about Mike Leach. <laughs> the state of Mississippi. How did you state. forget about the pirate? What a state. Also, but, shout out to Mike Leach for just being like, opening statements are dumb. Ask your questions. <laughs> yeah. That was also, wild. no tie. Team no tie. Yeah, he just stepped right in and said, go ahead questions his opening statement was questions that was his opening statement we got uh we played a, a clip today from his um from mike leach's uh i think it was on sirius xm he was wiping his mouth with a tie with his tie he wore a tie but he was wiping his mouth with it and then he said uh somebody looked it up and said the inventor of the tie was uh, came out in 1911 and he goes if anybody invents a time machine that guy's in trouble <laughs> <laughs> I oh first OU Mississippi State game 
we got to sit in on some leech somehow, somehow, some way. If one of us got to get to that post game because hey, uh, another guy, reason we want to join the SEC. Do you hear? Saban had guys up to his suite. Kiffin had. Um, I said Saban. I meant Kiffin. Kiffin Lane. Kiffin had players, uh, uh, media, up to his suite before the before the thing got going. And I think uh, Leach is in that kind of, you know, hey, yeah, sure, whatever you need. It's a different world, guys. Lane Gotta train. feed the beast. <laughs> Gotta feed the beast. A lane train. But, yeah, I love the Lane Kiffin comment of, like, USC the Big Ten. That's about this. That's a lateral move. <laughs> yeah. OU to the SEC. And that was the thing that Sankey said also. He said that OU in Texas, um, the SEC, that, that, is, that trumps, was the word, trumps uh, – uh, USC and UCLA, the Big Ten, We're just flatly saying it, like yeah. yeah and he's, he book. described it. He went on to describe it as we, we're in contiguous states. We're re- renewing old rivalries with Arkansas and, and Texas A and M. I'm sorry, with uh, Texas and Texas A and M, Texas and Arkansas, uh, Oklahoma and Missouri, old members. Yeah. He said we've got a quarter of the old Big Eight in the SEC now. Um, and then he said we're creating new rivalries with the potential for Arkansas and, and Oklahoma border rivals. They don't play much. I think I looked it up today. They played 13 times in their history, three times in the last hundred years. But boy, yeah, that's a great one. Arkansas and Oklahoma. So he's he's really touting the fact that listen, they're flying over to go to go to their games. And uh, I think it was Mike Leach said it's USC and UCLA are having to make five trips a year to into Big Ten territory. All those Big Ten teams are having to make one trip a year to the West coast. How's that fair? So good, yeah. good point. Um, and, and the fact that Sankey was, you know, touting contiguous States and regional rivalries and, and like-minded universities and stuff like that. Boy, he's, he nailed that one. Still just can't USC and UCLA playing in like the Minnesota snow. Is it going to just be White a, sight to behold? a sight to behold? Those colors just don't fit on a snowy tundra. Like it's just, it's off visually off. Well, Johnny, you do that. They're making five trips a year, and every other year, uh, USC is also going to South Bend. So every other year, half of USC's schedule is going to happen in Big Ten. Right. But hey, yeah. money. Right. Dollars. The realignment uh, continues to churn on. Of course, it's been the Big Twelve, Pac twelve. Look like they might merge. Then Big Twelve basically said, "No, nah, we're good. We're just going to try and post your teams instead." So it's uh, we're going to have a lot more. It's going to just continue to trickle out over the next year two, however long it takes for the dust to settle on this. Um, but wild times, um, certainly with the SEC media days, big 12 media days and uh, across the country right now with all the realignment shakeup. All right, we will real quick, some housekeeping before we get on. We have a ton of recruiting to talk about since our last show two weeks ago, OU's had commit after commit after commit after commit. It's been just a medley. So we're going to talk about all those guys one at a time in the second segment, but real quick, just this week, Dylan Gabriel, Maxwell and Davey O'Brien award watch list. Eric Gray this morning on the Doke Walker award watch list. You have to assume Marvin Mims is going to be on the Blitnikoff whenever that comes about. So there's your three-headed monster, uh, theoretically. Now, uh, to be totally fair, it seems like everybody and their mom gets put on these watch lists. They're, they're big lists. Um, but still, it says something, I think, uh, from from Oklahoma's standpoint, that all that, they, all that they lost, all that was made of, and they still have all these guys on these watch lists here with Gabriel and, and Gray this week. Yeah, watch list season. Here it comes. Full speed Just ahead. Be sure you tweet out the right gif. Right. Which one? Uh, on the uh, initial tweet for Dylan Gabriel on the Davy O'Brien, the gif that was attached from uh, the university account was still the Maxwell. Uh, oh, really? Yeah. yeah. I didn't even see that. That's funny. Had a double tweet. Uh, when you're on multiple watch lists, it can get confusing. Yeah, for sure. That would be the would be the, the, the rebuttal there from uh, from Dylan Gabriel. All right, so yeah, we'll continue to keep up with those. Keep up with allsooners.com. We'll have, uh, as those guys continue to roll out, there's pretty much like one a day right now. And again, figure men's on the Blitnikoff and some other ones will be coming up here pretty soon. Um, I'm going to go ahead and assume Turk's going to be on the uh, the old Ray guy. I'm going to go I'm gonna go out on a limb uh, on that one as well. Uh, all Preseason all Big 12 punter, uh, Michael Turk, uh, to you. So yeah, good stuff there. Um, as we continue to get those rolling out with each uh, each day. All right, we'll take a timeout. We'll come back. Like I said, a lot of recruiting to get to. We're talking about all the commits. Brent Venables, know you have been red hot on the recruiting show. We're talking about that next 
on the All Sooners podcast. On Twitter, you can follow All Sooners at all underscore Sooners. Ryan's at Radio's Ryan. Who's at John E. Hoover. I'm at Josh M. Calloway. Our website is allsooners.com. We are a Fan Nation affiliate, part of the Sports Illustrated Network. All right, guys. Pretty much right around the time that people were throwing dirt on Oklahoma on the recruiting trail, they have gotten just scalding hot commits seemingly every day for like a week and a half. It was a never-ending cycle. We talked about it a little on the, on the last minute show. They had a couple guys coming in. They've since added, since our last show two weeks ago, six more commits. They've moved into the top 10 in 247 sports recruiting rankings at number nine. They've been just, I mean, like I said, just red hot raking in the commits. We'll break them down one at a time. But before we do that, you guys just want to comment real quick on just I mean, this is as hot as OU in one time frame of recruiting. Who's been keeping up with it longer than obviously Ryan and I, but that I can recall as far as just the volume of guys in such a short time period. It's really been pretty incredible. Yeah, volume of quality guys too. Yeah, um, they're not like a bunch of three stars or something. Or right. Walk yeah. on. These are good players. Right. And and what you mean by good players is I'm looking at the 24-7 rankings right now. Uh, they've got eight guys – that are ranked uh, 0.9, okay, so 90%, right? Uh, basically an A, I guess, is the grade. I don't know. Uh, but 90% grade, um, they got eight of those guys, and seven of them have come since June 30th. Seven <laughs> of their top eight players on their rankings, according yeah. to 24-7 Sports, have, have come basically since the end of June, last day of June. So it's pretty remarkable. Um, Brent Venable said – and made it made it loud and clear. Don't commit to us if you're not committed to us. That's the way right. he phrased it. Essentially, do not commit. And I think guys took that to heart. And a lot of fans, you know, got a little angsty about not having any recruit, not having any any verbal commits. That's all part of Venable's plan. He nurtures those relationships on a on kind of a micro level. So when the the offers go out and the commits come in it actually means something. It's not just, you know, guys flitting around like, like, you know, flies on, you know what, they're actually landing on something that they believe in. So uh, it's been, yeah, this, this last probably three weeks has been kind of staggering. Well, I, not, not to pick on anyone else's recruiting or anything, but you talk about that right now, there's another battle going on involving the big 12. Um, Nova Sod is, Baylor, he's the quarterback. Baylor's trying to hold on for him for dear life. He's committed to Baylor. And in an interview he gave, I think it was with 247 Sports, during Big 12 Media Days when it published, he announced yeah. a top four schools, a top four schools, <laughs> a Baylor commit in an interview had to announce a top four, like another top four schools. That's not going to be the case in Oklahoma, right? You're not going to have to worry about that. Flips happen, yes. So it's not like a this is done, dusted, all that. But this is as close to trying to make that happen as you can when you look at what Clemson's classes have done. Um, and on top of that, we'll get into all the commits currently um, here in a second. But you also have re-ranking season as, as all those guys have gone on the, the spring camp tour, all that stuff. We've talked about Jackson Arnold, the quarterback commit, uh, winning Elite 11 or sorry, being named the Elite 11 MVP. He was officially given his fifth star by uh, 247 Sports. He's headed that way, it sounds like, with all the major recruiting rankings. So it's not just, hey, they finally are you building out this class with key guys. Those guys have been committed for a while as well. They're showing that the good evaluations on top of being able to close the deal. Actually, guys, I want to clarify and correct something I said. I think I said seven of their top eight have uh, committed in the last few weeks. It's six of their top seven ranked players. Um, and you could go back a month and Caleb Hicks would make it seven of eight, the running back. But yeah, just, uh, just in the month of June and July, <laughs> they've got so many guys <laughs> in, 20, in the last two months. It's just, it's I, I, like you said, Josh, I don't think I've ever seen it quite this hot. Yeah. It, it's piping hot. And uh, I think Brent Venables have an aneurysm. If a commit put out a top four guys already committed, <laughs> that was a wild move. Wild what? move. What's yeah. wrong with you, man? You said you were going to be committed. That's are you Johnny committed. Gigolo? Yeah, I would say Johnny <laughs> Gigolo, just all over the place. No loyalty. But, yeah, that, that's pretty wild stuff. But, yeah, Oklahoma. I mean, obviously, these guys are going to, you know, there's always the potential for flips. But this Brent Venable system 
seems you know to have a better chance of not flipping because again like we talked about many times on this show he doesn't want you to take visits or really talk to other schools once you've committed so we'll see how that works he did have one already ash and cozart flipped i mean it, it can still happen but you got to feel more solid about these guys than maybe guys in the past because of that that policy rent venables makes it maybe a little harder to lock a guy down but once you do you gotta feel better about keeping them. All right, so we'll talk about the six most recent commits. These guys have all committed since the last show two weeks ago, which is pretty incredible. We'll start with wide receiver Jaquez Petaway, five foot eleven, hundred seventy pounds. He's a four star in two four seven sports composite, number nine receiver in the class, number nine player in Texas, number fifty three overall player from Houston. Really fun to watch. I mean, just runs by guys. Um, if you watch his tape, there's some plays where he'll take a screen on the far side of the field and just like Bo Jackson and Tecmo Bowl come like all the way across, just zigzag around, just, just athleticism. And that, that's what jumps off the screen uh, with Padaway. This was a really good get that kind of came along sem- somewhat quickly. Uh, it seemed like um, it was like all of a sudden they were kind of trending toward him and then they got him really good to get here with, uh, with Mr. Padaway. Still muted too. A little coughing fit had to mute there for a second. Sorry, <laughs> I go. I broke into my Venables impersonation, and the cough took over. <laughs> How does he do that? Uh, no, what you saw the flip from uh, Ashton Cozart to go to to uh, Oregon, right? That opened up recruiting for Cole Adams here at Owasso. That didn't work out because um, he went to Alabama. They got in late on Cole Adams. So what happened? Jaquez Petaway comes along and he's a higher ranked receiver. He's a, you know, he's got more stars and more, you know, positional ranking and all that kind of stuff. I'd say that one worked out okay for Oklahoma. You're right, Josh. Uh, explosive, hits the holes quickly, instinctive. When there's a hole, he kind of, he's kind of got running back vision. When guys are blocking downfield for him, he can kind of navigate the lanes uh, right. before they even develop. It's, it's pretty impressive to watch. And Oklahoma, if you think about it, look at the five star receivers that they've gotten in the past three, four, five years. I don't see, uh, you know, Jaquez Petaway isn't necessarily in that mold. Uh, more, more of a Mario Williams probably than anything else. But um, just, he, yeah, he's this kid is ready-made. I, I haven't spoken with him. I've reached out to him, but haven't heard back. Um, but he's ready-made. He looks like he's ready-made. He's got to put on a few more pounds. 5'11", 170 is a little slight for big-time SEC football. Um, right. but, so, you know, if he could get up to say 185, 190, that would be something that, uh, I think the receiver coach at Oklahoma, whose name is Kale Gundy, not the running backs coaches. I put on Twitter <laughs> earlier this week. They were all over you right away. Too. Oh, I know. I had like 5,000 people light me up. I'm like, yeah, okay. It's, it's not 2004 typo. anymore. Jesus. My man Parker stood up for me and said, he's, uh, Kale Gundy's the, uh, running back coach emeritus because he landed. Uh, DeMarco Murray and uh, Adrian Peterson. But yeah. I digress. Uh, Jaquez Petaway looks to me like he's ready to step in as a true freshman. I know he's still got a senior year ahead of him, but he looks like he's ready to play. Well, just turn Schmidt loose on him, and he'll be fine on that front. Uh, absolute burner, like you said. I think you guys have covered the, the player evaluation. I think that the important thing to note here is kind of what you touched on in jest there, John. Um Dennis Simmons got a lot of credit, and rightfully so, for the job he did recruiting. When he left, I don't know if there was a panic or if people just forgot that Kale Gundy has been an ace recruiter, and for a long time before Lincoln Riley arrived, he was the ace in the hole on this offensive staff. It hasn't mattered whether he's been working with quarterbacks, running backs, wide receiver. It hasn't mattered. He has landed time and time again. Heads up battle with Texas, one that Oklahoma didn't really get going on until after the new staff had arrived. So this isn't a guy that they have a massive, massive, longstanding relationship with. Kale Gunny gets in there, throws his elbows around, and wins a big battle. Wide receiver recruiting is going to be just fine under Libby and Kale Gundy. Moving right along, just a couple days later, big Caden Green, offensive tackle, six foot five, three fifteen from Lee Summit, Missouri, four star, number eleven offensive tackle. In the class, number four player from Missouri, number 78 overall recruit. I love Caden Green. The guy is just a behemoth. I mean, just huge. Stands out. It's not hard. Whenever I make the highlight tapes, I was like, I put the ring on them so, so uh, you know people can find the players they're trying to watch the tape of. You don't even really need to do that for him. He is huge, and 
so many times it's hilarious that just a, a linebacker will come at him and he'll just take them and throw them like they're a child. He's he is an SEC player to me. He is a big old boy, future NFL, all that. I'm a huge fan of Caden Green. Just you know, a guy who you're looking at like, oh yeah, that'll do. Bill Beanbow is going to make that guy useful. He's a he's a Kansas City guy, but he's a Tulsa kid. He's from Tulsa. He's got Tulsa roots. His parents went to Oral Roberts. Uh, this yeah, this is impressive. He he might. I know this is premature. I know this is hyperbole, but ten years from now, we could look back at the twenty twenty three class and say who was the best, who became the best, who had the longest pro career, whatever it is. I think there would be a lot of people voting for Caden Green. He is spectacular, yeah. and I think it was David Stone who said uh, in in those camps that they do, you know, the the one on one camps, the D line versus O line camps, stuff like that, the kind of showcases. I think it was David Stone that said he's the best offensive lineman he's ever gone against. Correct. That's saying something. Yeah. So I can't wait to watch this kid play. He, again, look, this is one of those guys that looks ready-made. Well, and you look at it, we've talked a ton about Bill Biedenboe and what, what's been wrong the last couple of years because we talked about the 2018 offensive line, and on paper a lot of these recruits currently were higher rated than those guys that turned out. Uh, Caden Green – Highest rated offensive line recruit Bill Beanbow's landed at Oklahoma. When when you look at just the where he rated, player rankings overall, all that stuff, that is a different caliber of guy, like taking it to another level. Now that you've got, once again, the strength program back in place in the spot where you want. We know Schmitty specializes in offensive and defensive line, right? Like that's where he uh, really gets it going. You have to feel like things are going to get back on track for the Oklahoma offensive line, especially if they're landing guys like Caden Green. Stay hot, Bill Biedenboe. One day later, he makes another offensive line addition with Logan Howland from Princeton, New Jersey. Six foot seven, another big boy, 280. Number 47 offensive tackle, number 10 player in New Jersey. He's just a three star, not as highly touted. Uh, of course, I, well, we we're just saying there with Caden Green. I feel like Howland was a bit of a victim of his commit time here, um, committing one day after Caden Green. He didn't get quite the pub that he maybe otherwise would have gotten. He's a good player, though, and you watch his tape. He's got a lot to work with, the, the natural size and stuff like that. He's a little more of a project, obviously, than Caden Green is at a three-star player from New Jersey. But you watch him play, and you feel like, okay, there's definitely something to work with there. You know, it, Logan Howland feels like an opportunity to be a, a, you know, a, a key player for Oklahoma down the line uh, as well. Yeah, he's, he's a guy <clears> – <throat> excuse me. Didn't he start his career as a tight end? I was about to say. He, he, he would get out and catch passes on his tape. He had a few. Yeah, he'd get out watch his video. Yeah. What? He's, he's remarkably athletic. 6'7", uh, <laughs> 280. Uh, getting downfield, you know, making guys miss a little bit, you know, giving them a little shake when he, after he catches the ball. It's impressive to watch. So put that kind of footwork at <laughs> left tackle or right tackle. Um, they're probably going to be set there for a while, and they're not done. The, Bill, the work that Bill Beatenbow has done in, in this class on the offensive line, just just the offensive line, guys are starting to come together. You see a three-star, like you said, <clears throat> probably uh, a little bit underrated in terms of his yeah. uh, actual rankings, recruit rankings, stars, whatever. Probably just hasn't blown up yet uh, as, as his – Tape gets out there, and he has a senior season, and more more people see what he's capable of. I get the feeling his ranking is going to rise as well. Yeah, a hundred percent. Fall fell victim to it. He's a converted tight end, so there's just not a ton of tape out there of him playing offensive tackle. That that so a lot of his ranking, I would imagine right now, is a lot of projection. On you look at you mentioned the six seven, you look at his frame, and you kind of look at him, you're like. Yeah, you get him in an offensive line conditioning program, and he's going to pack on a little bit even more, right? So uh, incredibly athletic, and, and as we know, uh, the Sooners have had some success with guys, converted tight ends, converted quarterbacks coming in to play offensive tackle. A lot of big-time yeah. success, too. A couple days later, back to the defensive side of things uh, for the first time in this little stretch that we're talking about, P.J. Adabore. hopefully said that correctly because he's going to be a really good player. We're going to be saying his name a lot, so we're going to need to learn it. Uh, how to say it properly. I think I got it there. Number 11 edge in 247 Sports Composite, number five player in the state of Missouri. He's a four-star there. On three has him as a five-star and the number seven player in the class um, in their in their on 300 is what they call it. Um, so obviously he's, he's a very positively trending 
player. It seems like his stock is just continuing to rise and rise and rise. Kansas City kid, 6'4", 240, really athletic, really physical. I and mean, he, he lays the boom on you. When he tackles you, he makes you remember it. Um, he feels like somebody who's going to be a lot of fun, um, especially, I mean, just – with you know, it, it, it's kind of beating a dead horse a little bit with a lot of these guys, but with Schmitty and especially on the defensive side with Brent Venables and just this defensive staff, who it feels like he has potential to be really, really special. Yeah, you mentioned a six four two forty with a seven foot wingspan, and then watch him play. Watch him play in those uh, pass rush drills. You know, the seven on seven, the the, the O line, D line camps, and stuff like that. Watch him dip his shoulder and get under guys, watch him crouch and get underneath guys, Six four two forty with seven foot wingspan and can play low. Uh, he's got incredible upper body strength. Uh, when Smitty gets a hold of him, you'll see him improve his lower body strength, obviously, but just an absolute beast throwing guys. Beast. You, you see, you see in those pass rush drills, again, no pads, no helmets, no anything. It's just a guy saying hut and two guys going at it. You see him throwing guys, Five star offensive lineman picking them up and throwing them out of the way and saying, you know, I'm I'm going to tag this bag. What you know, the pass rush drills. It's really shocking to see this kid's progression from, oh, he's a nice player to, oh my God, he's a he's a five star. It's been it's been kind of shocking to watch how fast he's risen. You, you talked about it a little bit, but the thing that excites me most about him is the bend and the angles that he just instinctively takes coming off the edge. Uh, that stuff that. Yes, it can be taught, but a lot of that is that's football instincts. That's someone that's going to be right. a predator in the backfield, right? Talk about just a enormous win for Miguel Chavis. Like we've talked a ton about Brent Venables doesn't have a proven track record as a head coach. So if anyone is kind of worried about committing to that, they kind of have a little bit of pause. But Brent Venables has almost 30 years of being an elite defensive coordinator, right, to speak to. Miguel Chavis is coming in. He's a guy that has just done spot duty on the field coaching. When, when people on Clemson staff were in and out with COVID, t- stepping up to his first on the field job, you paired that with kind of the stuff that Ethan Downs talked about, which go watch Ethan Downs talk about Miguel Chavis um, from Big 12 Media Day. And you're just like, holy cow, what is Oklahoma going to be with? We've talked a ton about Todd Bates. This is what Chavis is in year zero, basically. What's this going to look like next year, two years from now? Yeah, Miguel Chavez feels like a rising star. And we, we talked about that back in the spring, getting to hear from him for the first time. It was kind of obvious then, but you're starting to see the fruits of that on the recruiting trail. And like Ryan said, with what Ethan Downs was saying about him, he seems like he is a smash hit so far. And obviously they haven't had a game yet in Oklahoma with, with this regime, but he's off to a, a great start um, so far in Norman. Moving along a few days later, while Brent Venables was at Big 12 Media Days doing his breakout session, Oklahoma's landing another really good running back. Dalen Smothers, 5'11", 182, from Charlotte, North Carolina. He's number 13 running back in the class, number 10 player in North Carolina. He's a four-star. Really fun tape. One of the most fun tapes of any guy just because his entire reel is just him breaking like 50 tackles and then housing it or getting out and catching a pass or just making guys miss. He is a lot of fun. He's like a Madden creative player with just his speed and just ability – he, he, he keeps the legs churning. He's not an easy tackle at all. And it's hilarious that there was a time where DeMarco Murray was, people were questioning his ability to get guys, to get recruits, because he has been doing a fantastic job, add some others to the list. Also, all-time pump fake in his commit. Um, you guys saw that. Whenever he committed, he took an Alabama hat. And guys do this from time to time. But this was one of the more aggressive ones I've ever seen, where he took – and I'll be in my hat and like had it all the way on practically was like, uh, uh, no. And then he just went to the OU hat pretty, uh, pretty aggressive. He kind of fooled me for a second. I was like 99% he was coming to OU and he had me a little bit like a little, a little caught off guard, but great name too. I, I'm a big fan of this kid. I think he's got a chance to be uh, a lot of fun here coming up for, for DeMarco Murray in this offense. Yeah. You, you look at his frame, 5'11", 182, you know, he, in, a, in a year or two of being in Oklahoma, he could play at 200 easy. Uh, add some add some muscle to that frame. He runs track, so you know he's explosive. You know he's got the top end speed. He's going to be a guy that can fly past you, but you put a little muscle on him. You put about 10, 15 pounds of muscle on him. Uh, he's going to be an impressive guy. You mentioned it, Josh. Alabama wanted him. Uh, obviously, a bunch of people wanted him, but uh, he chose Oklahoma over Alabama. He yeah. chose Oklahoma over Florida State. 
which has put together some really good running backs over the years, as we all know. And then a local team, NC State, you know, he considered them. So uh, for him to be coming all the way to Oklahoma to play running back, he loved him some DeMarco Murray. You can tell that. Josh, you mentioned it. His, his highlight reel is a ton of fun. It just put him, uh, pull up allsooners.com, find uh, Jaquase Petaway's highlights and put that over on one, then pull up another window and put uh, some other's highlights and let those two yeah. run side by side. And uh, get a little peek into the future. That's gonna be a ton of fun. Nice combo with Smothers and Caleb Hicks too. The the Didden kid is already committed um, in as well. So Demarco Murray once again bringing in two quality running backs. It looks like we can get them across the line to signing day, just like he did last year. Another position group, like we talked about, the offensive line that had gotten under dire straits a little bit the last couple of years because they were so committed to the quality over quantity which is great until those guys flip and go to Alabama. <laughs> Wrapping it up with uh, the sixth commit of this stretch, uh, linebacker Lewis Carter, six foot, 200 pounds from Tampa, Florida, number 11 linebacker in the class, number 37 player in the state of Florida. He's a four-star committed to Oklahoma. I think that was on, was that on, what day was that? Monday? I can't remember. It's all, it all blurs together, but he has, in his tape, some of the hardest hits I've ever seen. He kills people. I mean, there was one where he blocked a punt. This poor punter, this kid, the punter was like a hundred pounds soaking wet, and he just absolutely crushed him. He crushed him. He has again some of the hardest hits. Now, I I, I watch him and I see his physicality and his speed, his athleticism, because also he played both ways in, in high school. He would run, he would just house like an 80 yard touchdown, too. Like just give him the ball and go. And on defense, he's annihilating people out over the middle. He'll also pick off passes. He's kind of a do it all guy in high school. But what's crazy about these hits is that for the most part, he's pretty much just a human spear, right? He's just like flying into people and just sending them flying back. So I watch that. And I'm thinking, my gosh, and he gets some like really good coaching. He's going to be insane because right now he's really just wreaking havoc on pure athleticism and just being insane. <laughs> Who just keeps laughing? But I can't. <laughs> I just I, I can't wait to see what he looks like with Brent Venables and these guys get a hold of him because right oh, now what he's doing is just smoking people. So I'm excited to see what he looks like, uh, you know, with with Schmitty and and these coaches. My apologies. I just I had the story called up on our website and the little the, in a in a little window down on the bottom his foot his tape his highlight tape was running. <laughs> that punter had to weigh about a hundred pounds. He crushed him. I felt so bad. That kid was a stick. <laughs> he he crushed like a, him. Like a five foot tall, hundred pound freshman or something. I'd love to if we ever get a hold of him. I'd love to ask him. Were you even yeah. trying to block that punt? No, you that just, you can you watch watch, watch, the, watch the video. He makes the choice. He chooses violence. He does. He chooses not to block the punt. He's like, this punter is standing here holding the ball. I'm going to take him out and just <laughs> annihilates him. Uh, you're right, Thank Josh. You. Um, after watching all the highlight videos, after watching the offense, the defense, the stuff that we've got posted up there, this kid's tape is my favorite. I think that we've ever had on our website. He is a heat-seeking missile. He loves contact. He just destroys people. He's going to get yeah. like arrested for injuring people <laughs> on the football field at some point. He is very aggressive. It is fun to watch somebody play with that level of aggression in high school football. He's going to. Here's the thing. Here's why he's not the number one player in the country. Six foot, two hundred pounds. He plays like somebody who's six six, two fifty five. He plays like a Lawrence Taylor. Seriously, where you're constantly going forward. You're constantly a hundred percent. You know, you don't have to read the offense. You don't have to anticipate what the the quarterback's going to do because your job is to break the quarterback in half. Boy, the way he goes after people is just fun to watch. I'm not calling him Lawrence Taylor. Don't be stupid. I'm not calling him Lawrence Taylor. I'm saying he has that kind of mentality where he might not be the biggest player on the field, but he's going to be the hardest hitting. Yeah, this is that Brent Venables special, right? Like we, we were out there for those – five um, viewing sessions in spring practice where you hear from Jay Valai, from Venables, from everyone like physicality, physicality, violence. We need it. We hit here. We hit at Oklahoma, all that stuff. This is someone that I doubt that he will uh, ever get, have to be told that at practice. If anything, they're going to be like, that guy's on our team. Let's not murder them in spring ball, please. 
Um, he, he, yeah. he might get banned from the W drill, or we're going to have a Travis Lewis situation on the first day of fall camp, yeah. which is not great. But uh, the highlight tape is fun. But the thing that just uh, stands out to me is like the first couple of highlights you get are, hey, someone tried to squib a kickoff and he picks it up and takes it to the house. So, you know, I mean, there's a fumble recovery that gets muffed and he's immediately on it. He's on the football always. And he's got that athleticism outside of just the physicality, the instincts and stuff that you can't really measure. Um, if you just told me he, he was 6'3", exactly what you're saying, Hoove, that he would have been shooting all the way up. So Brent Venables had to have been like, wait, wait, wait. Everyone else going to pass on this guy over two inches? Yeah, we'll take him. The guy that comes to mind when you when you talk about reining him in at practice is Tony Cade, 2003, 2004, 2005 safety. Uh, got kicked off the team eventually for knocking the hell out of people. And then when the coach saying, stop it, I told you to stop it. How many times do I have to tell you to stop it? Okay, that's it. You're out of practice. He yells back at the coach because he's such aggressive mindset, such an uh, aggressive player. Um, they haven't had a player. They haven't had a lot of players like that you know, over the years. Um, I get the feeling. I get the feeling that Lewis Carter is one of those players. Yeah, he's a blast to watch. I recommend people go check out his tape and uh, learn more about him because he's going to be a lot of fun to keep up with here in the years ahead. Do want to add real quick, too, before we uh, bounce out and we'll come back with some other sports to get through uh, before we send you on your way. Uh, they had another preferred walk-on from within the state. Don't want to forget him. Reese Taylor, who uh, is from Plainview High School in Ardmore, kind of does it all in, in high school in, at, uh, at Plainview. Plays like quarterback, I think, and running back. He kind of does, does – he plays defense – He's going to be a running back, it looks like, at Oklahoma. He's got fun tape. We have highlights of him on all students as well. Fun tape, in-state kid. I don't know what kind of a role he'll ever have at Oklahoma, but this is, again, another example of Oklahoma taking care of in the state. We've seen them do this a lot of times, um, you know, going, making sure to pick up the guys in the state. Chapman McCown from, is that Norman North, uh, right? And Gavin Freeman from Heritage Hall. You know, making sure that these guys in the state are taken care of. And they may, you know, they kind of get these – a little of these these seed lines to uh, maybe guys down the road, you know, from, yeah. from doing this kind of thing. Absolutely, and maybe one of those guys blossoms into a Wes Welker or something like you that. Know. You never know. And Venables was on that staff in '99. He saw Wes Welker, so um, yeah, you 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 got to keep those channels open with the local coaches, the local coaching staffs, and the local communities. People love Oklahoma football. Well, they want to really love Oklahoma football if you will recruit some mm. of their players and bring them to campus. So it's a great idea. Does that fall under the dirty hard work done in the dark mantra as, as far as recruiting goes? <laughs> I think so. Have you guys seen uh, the pic? Is, uh, there was a picture like a day or two ago circulating of, of Taylor, um, like working out. The guy is huge. He, he's, he's, he's trying to, to work his way into the – that's the thing also. He's preferred walk on this year. He's a 22 graduate. He, he's coming to the team. He's on the team now. Um, they, they picked him up and added him, and he's, he's working hard. There was a picture of him. Uh, lifting, it was like, good lord, he looked like he, he reminded me of like uh, one of the gymnastics guys, you know, just like kind of sh- not at all, but just what you're saying. Think about that. If you if you're a preferred walk on at Oklahoma, you get nutrition, you get Schmitty, you get all these uh, perks that you you do not get at uh, if you were to go say if you were to say I want to go play at East Central, I want to go mm. play at UCO. Um, nothing, nothing against those schools, but you're not going to get the same level of, uh, expertise, attention, um, whatever it is. Right. So go get the, go to Oklahoma, build yourself up, become a even better player, tougher player, stronger player, work the scout team, see what division one football is all about. And then the last couple of years of your career, if it's not working out for you, if you feel like you're not going to play, then you can go to a smaller school and you will be a dominant force because you've been tested at, o, at a place like OU. So it's a great model to follow for a lot of these younger guys. Absolutely. So, yeah, we'll keep it up with him. We'll see if, uh, you know, maybe we get a chance to see him and, you know, UTEP or Kent State, one of these games that you assume will get out of hand. Um, we'll see. I mean, you know, maybe down the road. Who knows? I mean, these walk-ons, you know, Jaden Knowles, Ty Hudson, you know, they've, they've played a little bit of a minor role at times. So it, it could definitely happen for this kid. We'll, uh, we'll keep an eye on him moving forward all right that's it we'll take a timeout we'll come back with some other sports to kind of wrap up patty gas oh my god stop just give other people a chance she made two more huge transfer ads since our last show 
And the MLB draft was unkind or kind to, to OU, depending on how you look at it, I guess. We'll talk about that next on the All Sooners podcast. Final segment of the All Sooners podcast, episode 132. Got some other sports to get to here that will send you on your merry way into your July weekend. Stay cool. It is just melt your face out there right now. My house can't keep up. My AC, it, it's been, I've never had really an issue with it, but the last couple weeks, it can't keep up. It's getting hot in my house like during the daytime. It's awful. It's a struggle. I don't yeah. know how you guys are, are handling that. But I'm here. It cools off about 9 o'clock every night at my house. Right. Exactly. During the day, it's like, holy moly. I'm sh- I'm sweating out here. But uh, I'll still take it over the winter any day. We had that discussion before. Give me 110 over zero all day. <laughs> Disagree. <laughs> Agree Let's go to this. some softball. Let's go to some softball. Uh, we've talked about this a few times over the course of the uh, off season here. And we're going to talk about it again. I mean, it's the evil empire. I mean, they're they're getting anybody they want. Oklahoma and Patty Gasso just continue to raid the portal at an obscene rate. They did it again with two more big ads. We'll start with the Pac-12 freshman of the year. And this was admittedly a bit of a while ago. We didn't get to talk about it on the last show. So we'll touch on it real quick. Pac-12 freshman of the year, Sidney Sanders commits to Oklahoma. Her numbers are ridiculous. She was a freshman of the year. So obviously that means she has multiple years of eligibility left, you know, after, you know, the last season, she's still going to be, she's going to be in Norman for several seasons. Pretty ridiculous. Another big ad here and a young one at that here for Oklahoma. So she was uh, one of the three, I guess, national freshman of the year uh, candidates. Jordy Ball won that award. This girl was up for that award right. among the finalists. Uh, it's an embarrassment of riches. Um, she's going to play – Ryan, she's going to play first base or she's going to play third base? First. Th- first base. This will be my projection. You're going to have Sanders at first, mm-hmm. Torres will come in and play third, and you'll just keep a, keep Alyssa Brito out in left field. As she, I know Patty Gasso really enjoyed um, what she was developing into out there defensively in left field. So you basically – from Arizona State, plucked your replacements on the corners for Jana Johns and Taylor Snow. And oh, by the way, Sidney Sanders carries a much bigger bat than Johns or Snow ever brought to the table. Pretty ridiculous. I mean, just, I don't even know what to say. They just, they're loaded up. I mean, they look like they're going to be a monster again. Ryan, real quick. Actually, okay, I'll ask you, the, I'm going to try to remember to ask you this after we talk about Haley Lee. So they got Haley Lee as well. From Texas A&M, who, if you recall, she was like the only one hitting when OU played A&M um, in the regional. She was the one to like stomp on the plate and stuff like that. So she's got a big, big personality, um, comes over from the Aggies, was a veteran out there, really good player. Uh, again, I mean, my my goodness, just, just plugging holes that aren't even really totally there. Um, I assume she'll be the catcher. Ryan can speak on it better than me. Um, but, yeah, Haley Lee comes over from Texas A&M, another big ad here. Yeah, you'll have Hanson will catch, um, and I know they really like Sophia Nugent, who you saw probably in, in the, the smallest of spot duties there as well. Um, my expectation is that Haley Lee is going to come in, and first off, she's really versatile just in the field, right? It seemed like everyone on that AM team across that regional in Norman played two or three positions in the field, primarily at catcher. Uh, this is your going to come in and fight for the DP spot, uh, a much more proven commodity um then a, a grace green obviously taria coleman who people were excited about she hit the transfer portal you're starting to see why because when you come to oklahoma if you don't come onto the scene as a freshman patty gasso can go to the transfer portal and get uh a haley lee who set Texas a record for home runs in a single season uh in 2020 she's the one like you said josh that if you remember in that 3-2 game she's the reason that a m scored two runs she hit that two run shot off of hope trout wine the only one that really did anything, like you said, Josh. So um, I, I would expect maybe she'll be some spot duty so that Hanson doesn't have to catch day in, day out. But uh, she'll come in, she'll be your DP, and you've just added between Sanders and Haley Lee another couple of bats that are going to make it virtually impossible to pitch around Tiare Jennings. Remember that big question, why do people pitch to Joss now? Well, you got Tiare Jennings. Sydney Sanders hit 21 home runs as a true freshman. Now she'll have JT Gasso. Uh, I would be stunned if Jennings and Sanders aren't paired back-to-back to kind of create that same effect. And you'll have 
Haley Lee bounced around somewhere as well, probably the DP spot. So the, the yeah, you mentioned uh, Kinsey Hansen, uh, gold medalist Kinsey Hansen, by the way, Team USA just spent uh, a couple of weeks winning uh, the gold medal there with her team. So that was cool. That was cool to see her get the gold medal around her neck and you know do the sooner shout outs that she was doing. Um, the question becomes this. And it's a question that I think Patty Gasso has got to answer at some point. And it's a question that I think uh, coaches like Lane Kiffin, um, Lincoln Riley have to answer. If you're super, super heavy in the transfer portal, now a lot of these portal additions replace graduated seniors. A lot of these portal additions replace players who hit the transfer portal themselves. But if you're getting portal additions to – take the job that a freshman had come in the year before saying, I'm going to get that job in 2023. Oh, wait, they replaced me with an all American out of the transfer portal. It looks like I'm not going to get to play until 2025. That can that possibly hurt your recruiting? Um, again, I don't think that <laughs> has, has anything to worry about. She's going to continue to hit recruit the portal as well as any coach in college in any level in, in any sport. And it's not going to be a hindrance but she just signed back-to-back number one recruiting classes, number one ranked recruiting classes. Are those girls going to start looking around saying, wait a minute, do I want to go play at OU where I might get replaced in the portal by an All-American and I don't really have time to develop, or do I want to go play somewhere else? I'm, I'm not saying, you know, I'm not criticizing. I'm just saying that's that's a phenomenon that's starting to maybe take place here. Yeah, I, that'll be something that coaches have to manage across the country. But you also look for the last just two years, right? For Patty Gasso, you had true freshmen in Tiara Jennings and Jada Coleman, who were not just starters, but key pieces yeah. of that team in 2020 and uh, 2021 and again in 2022. This last year, Jordy Ball was handed the ball from the first game. She was handed it at UCLA. She was the ace of the staff. And it was just due to injury that she wasn't prominently featured in the postseason. I think the pitch is really simple. If you're that good, you will play. There is a pathway. Patty Gasso is not afraid to play freshman. The people that are getting replaced are your Taria Coleman's who come in and really only yeah. make a handful of appearances as a true freshman because they can't crack the lineup. Like what all Patty Gasso is ensuring is that her depth is proven quality or the top of the top as opposed to uh, having to rely on a player that, you know, you maybe took us because they're local or something like that. I, I don't think it's as much of a issue for Patty Gasso specifically, because she has that recent track record of pathway for freshmen to start, but it's something that other coaches across the country will have to deal with for sure. Yeah. Well, if you're not the best freshman in the country, <laughs> it's a different animal because they've had literally the best freshman in the country for the last two years. Uh, plus Jada Coleman, who was an all American this year. Um, it's a unique problem. It's a great problem to have, I would think. And I do, Ryan, I'll disagree with you. I think it is a little bit uh, something that Patty Gasso has to deal with that other coaches don't. And that is you get the number one high school player in the country, the number one high school recruiting class in the country, and then right. you go out and supplement with the number one transfer portal in the country. I think that's – it's going to create it. Some, what, we've seen it with Taria Coleman already. She had impeccable high school credentials. She comes to Oklahoma, can't get on the field. Well, I guess I'll transfer because they're bringing other transfer portal people in. So, you know, everybody's going to get there, so I'm not worried about it. You know, Oklahoma's gonna, still going to win the national championship. I'm I'm fairly convinced of that. But And, and Taria Coleman's going to have a great career wherever she goes. I think she's a fantastic player. She just wasn't able to crack the lineup, like you said, as a true freshman at Oklahoma, best program in the country. Right, right. And that's a good point, Ryan, too, to go back to, to Lee. You know, I kind of forget, not forget, but, you know, one thing that is you don't want Jocelyn Allo to leave. So out of context, obviously, you want Allo to be on your team forever. But that is one little nice thing is that you have the DP spot to kind of play around with a little bit now. And, you know, before where it was kind of she's your DP every game, pencil her in. Now you can kind of you have a little more flexibility there. You can tinker a little bit more uh, with your lineup now that that spot is vacated uh, by Allo leaving uh, for sure. Ryan, what I wanted to ask you real quick was just as it stands now with the players that they've added, are they better next year? I mean, right now, are they a better team than they were this past year? Uh, it, it's hard to say just because you're losing a sure thing 
defensively in Jana Johns and Taylor Snow. Not that Torres or Sidney Sanders aren't, but they have had proven it at the World Series in Championship Series games, right? You had Joss right. Allo, who not only was the best hitter in the country, best hitter in the sport, she also was insanely clutch. So you're bringing a ton of talent that's had a lot of production. What you have to know is can that talent produce in the biggest moments? Because that's something that that was we talked about it so much that very rarely do you have a player who's as good as Joss Allo, who seems to show up when the spotlight is brightest, when there's the most pressure, all that stuff. Uh, the talent level, is it certainly comparable? Yes, but uh, we'll just have to see if these incomers can pair that like clutch gene along with the production because that's what you're right. losing is you were losing clutch players yeah. from Oklahoma. That's a good point. You, you bring in talent, you bring in numbers. They've never done it in the postseason. They've never done it in Oklahoma City. That's that's when uh, that's what you're judged on when you're Oklahoma. You they would they sure. would they go 57 and three last year? One of the arguably the best team in history with the offense and the defense leading the the team the lead, leading the nation. I think and was it batting average, home runs for sure, um, and then uh, slugging percentage, and then uh, earn run average, leading an earn run average. How in the hell do you lead in both offense and <laughs> pitching? It's impossible. It's crazy. Uh, and last year, remember they led the nation in defensive fielding percentage. So best in the country uh and the and people still want like if they wouldn't have won the national championship these last two seasons we wouldn't be having this discussion but yeah best in the country and national champion it's an it's a important distinction certainly gonna be fun to watch um anticipation will be high i'm gonna go ahead and go on a limb and say they'll be preseason number one again <laughs> um that's i'm gonna take a shot in the dark there i know it's bold in july way too early rankings but hey uh, how are uh, josh come on how is Oklahoma supposed to manufacture motivation if we're sitting here on a podcast saying they're number one <laughs> in the country? They're joining the SEC, man. Would it be last place in the SEC? Oh, we're talking about baseball or softball. Patty, Patty's got her work cut out for uh, manufacturing some motivation. That's for sure. Um, that's for sure. Um, speaking of Alo, she won the SB last night for best female college athlete. This feels like an all-time duh. Um, I mean – She's arguably the best female college athlete ever. I mean, so I, I would say so in 2022. I mean, she has competition, obviously. Um, Leah Boston from South Carolina stands out, basketball player and stuff like that. But this, I mean, slam dunk um, uh, for Allo to get all the awards basically on the way out here after her career wrapped up uh, this past June. Bro, when you hit more home runs than Pete and Cavillia by a lot, <laughs> you know you're doing something good. She she deserves that SB uh like maybe five more of them. I think the team is up for like two more. So she that comes up best team, up right? For record breaking performance for going yard in Hawaii. And then the team gets tossed into the championship performance with uh it's a long shot because you're you're always alongside, you know, like the Warriors and all that stuff. But you're in there. In there, in the mix. We get to hear Chris Plank's call again one more time yeah. in, the, in the islands. We get to hear Chris Plank <laughs> say, Jocelyn, uh, what's her name? What's her middle name? It's a lot. It is. She's got a few. Aloha. <laughs> uh, any, look, anytime there's a video package that's going to show Hooves, Rams, and OU softball comparably, that's where you want your program to be. Absolutely. Yeah, pretty pretty good place. Yeah, a lot of the team is out there in California. Justin Allo, Cooper Cup, Steph Curry. I mean, balance it out. Who's the best? Yeah. A lot of the team is out there in uh, California, and they were at the All-Star game last night, like Ryan was saying, during the break. And uh, I saw a picture of a lot of them. Grace Lyons, Yankees jersey. That's what I'm talking about. I don't know who it was, but I saw a Yankees jersey, and I, I – I, I perked up. I was like, that's, that's what's up. That's what we're talking about. I didn't know I could like Grace Lyons anymore, but yes, in a Yankees jersey, she just increased her Q rating in my book. (laughs) Giancarlo Stanton, all-star game MVP last night, representing um, as the AL won their ninth in a row domination. Anyway, sticking with baseball, though, transition. MLB draft was over the weekend into the early part of this week. Like I said in the tease there, it was really kind to OU or really awful to OU, depending on how you look at it. They had the most players drafted, the most, number one, 11 Nation. players. Nobody had more. Um, and that doesn't even include the two transfers that they had. 
Uh, Kyle Nevin from Baylor got drafted as well. He was transferring in from, to, from uh, to OU. And Cale Davis, Oklahoma State reliever who transferred to OU, he got drafted as well. So if you include them, 13 dudes who you – not that you, you didn't expect a lot of them to be on the team next year, but 13 guys who you're probably going to lose. Um, it was it, – oh, you got ravaged in the draft. I mean, they were – you know, Kendall Roger, D1 Baseball – he put out his biggest winner and biggest loser from the MLB draft. OU was the biggest loser from the MLB draft because they <laughs> lost so much. And again, it's a testament to the program, and it's a it's obviously a net win in recruiting and stuff. Saying, look at all the guys we just put in the pros. But as far as the twenty three team, it stinks because you just lost a bunch of guys who you thought you might have your David Sandlins, your Chaz Martinez's, uh, your Blake Robertsons. Um, I mean, the, the Peyton Grams and Bennett and Horton and Crooks, those guys were gone. But those fringe guys who you thought you might have a shot, they all got drafted high enough that I think they're going to get swayed away and signed. So uh, a lot of work to do for Oklahoma. They're going to have to fill a lot of holes. But it is still exciting for the program to have, again, the most guys drafted of any team. I mean, that, that's a big statement. That's a huge statement. How good was that team last year? They were national runner-up. You know, yeah. you look back on right. it. When we when we went into that season last year, Josh, they're, we were looking ahead, and it was like, okay, they're going to – Finished last in the SEC. We gave him semi-infamous for that, right? <laughs> How many guys were going to get drafted? Not that many. A few. They got guys drafted that didn't even play this year, you know. So, uh, but then again, they got they got other guys drafted who were coming off a uh, uh, you know Tommy John and figuring out what position they had to play, and they became the default uh, de facto, I guess, Sunday starter in Big Twelve play and the best pitcher in the postseason. And went first round to the Cubs, number seven overall. Number I mean, seven. Shocking. I mean, not shocking after watching him pitch. But if you had told me this time last year that he's going to have Tommy John, Kate Horton, have Tommy John, and, you know, not know what – be slowed down this year, not know what position he was, start at third base and become a kind of a guy on the mound, and all of a sudden he's going to be the seventh pick in the draft, I would have said, you're crazy. But yeah, that's – uh, He's Horton so – Kyler. Horton Man, beat Kyler. Good. Kyler got drafted ninth uh, his year, so he yep. beat Kyler Murray by a couple spots. What an wow. unbelievable ascension for yeah. Kate Holton. I mean, and it, this team, he's the perfect. Right. He's the perfect representative for this team. Just kind of came out of nowhere. Nobody expected anything, and here he is, first rounder in the Major League Baseball draft. Right. Well, the the positive side of that too is you kind of touched on it. We, we've talked about this before. Skip is a great recruiter. Like, regardless of what was happening on the field, um, whether it be things getting taken away from a team in 2020 or, or underachieving 2021, being incredible in 2022, Skip's been a great recruiter all through that. So now that happens. He'll go and hit the trail once again and say, hey, we've always had this. Now there's a couple of spots. It's a little easier to recruit a few guys when you say there's a pathway, right? Come play this. Come play with us. Look at what we just did. We'll do this again next year. Come work under me. And you already saw him tweet out a little looky here action earlier this morning. So <laughs> it's a challenge you want to have as a coach and as a program. And it's a challenge that I'm sure that Skip and crew will attack head on. When he goes out and recruits, he's going to tell people, we are the 2019 LSU Tigers of college baseball. You come here, we're going to send you to the pros. You know, right? Uh, Alabama yeah. football, Georgia football right now of – of college baseball. So that's, that's a hell of an accomplishment, especially pitching. I mean, the entire, this is the, again, the entire rotation gets drafted. He's going to replace the entire rotation and their number four guy, Chaz Martinez and their closer, Trevin Michael, and a couple of relievers who he barely had to use and Jarrett Godman and uh, Javier Ramos, seven pitchers, seven pitchers in one go uh, drafted. So uh, definitely a big, big week for the program. And Skip tweeted out a graphic that had, the total signing bonuses money on it. Like, look at how much money all these guys just made. Yeah. That can that can be you. You can be next. So, um, Josh, how many of these guys come back? I don't know if any of them are. Uh, honestly, I mean, I would have thought after day two came and went and David Sandlin hadn't been drafted yet, I thought, oh, he's probably going to get him back. That's a big win to get David Sandlin back. But then he gets drafted early in the 11th round. And whenever you have a full night – in morning to talk to teams, they're not going to use a pick on the in the eleventh round a guy who they don't think is going to sign. So he they he probably already talked to teams and said, you know, I 
for the right number, I will sign in the 11th round. So I, I think probably there's a pretty good chance all these guys go, <laughs> honestly. I mean, the only there's a couple of fringy ones. Maybe Chaz Martinez thinks about it, but I think there's a pretty good chance a lot of these guys go. So which is, uh, if not all of them, which is uh, pretty nuts. And then, yeah, you got the two transfers too. Nevin and, and Davis, who are both going to be a big part of the team next year. I think they're probably both going to sign too. So definitely a big hit on the 23 team. And it'll be a young team again uh, next year. Certainly, because there's going to be a lot of, a lot of new faces uh, for this for this program after losing a bunch through the draft, which is a good thing, but a bad thing at the same time, uh, obviously. So quite the draft for Oklahoma. All right, guys, I think that's it. Is that it? We got everything. It was a it was a packed in show after a week away. We was kind of, it was almost a double show. It went pretty long, but uh, I think we got lots of ground covered. Yeah, good show. <laughs> I just need the shield now. Can you can you have your buddy cook up another one of those bad boys? Send it this way. The shield. That's my the favorite podcast shield. shield. Yeah, it's been certified too. He made it. Certified fresh. Certified fresh. Certified fresh. We're almost back to that. Just a little over six weeks. That's it. Six weeks from Saturday, Oklahoma and UTEP will collide at the stadium. We finally get some games. We're getting somewhere, folks. We're getting close. So stick with us. We'll be back next Wednesday. For next week's show, wrapping up anything else that's happened on the recruiting trail, other sports, there's going to be stuff. More watch list season is upon us. All that fun stuff. So catch up with us next week on the All Sooners podcast. You can listen to that one. All the shows on iTunes, Spotify, Google, iHeart, wherever you get your podcast. If you have an Amazon deal device, just say Alexa, play the All Sooners podcast. They also post on our website, allsooners.com. Click on the playlist on your phone, your tablet, or your computer. For Ryan Chapman and John Hoover, I'm Josh Calloway. We'll catch you guys next time.